So the next speaker is going to be Jack Tuzinski from the University of Alberta. He's going to talk about um, cytoskeletal information processing, intracellular information processing. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for putting this together. It's a great workshop uh, in a great place, very inspirational for all of us. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist who is now a professor of experimental oncology, so I guess uh, I've reached my level of incompetence. Uh, but I'll be talking about something else today. Um, first of all, acknowledge the sources of funding and, in particular, uh, technology innovations uh, with Mike Wiener, who has been faithfully supporting my group for a number of years. But there is a lot of other sources of funding. Most of it, by the way, is, is for a different purpose. The, uh, uh, and collaborators, I want to acknowledge collaborators with Stuart and, and Vahid Rezania and Holly Friedman and Avner Priel, Horatio Cantiello and John Dixon, Milka Sataric. And being here, I'm not going to give any references whatsoever. Just Google Tuzinski Tubulin, and you'll get all the references. So, so I'm not going to waste any information on these slides. Um, OK. My, my day job is actually computational drug design. Uh, and this is where the, most of the funding is coming from. That's a fraction of my group. We, I don't have current pictures uh, <laughs> available. We, uh, we do computer uh, design and testing in silico searches for novel cancer chemotherapy drugs. So that's basically what we do for a living. But because microtubules are everywhere, uh, microtubules play a role in, in both the onc oncology aspects as well as the neuroscience aspect, which is more of a long-standing interest. And I'm going to try and follow the best I can the, the tough acts that we heard today, this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> it's not easy, and especially now with 5 o'clock, and for some of you, probably it's early morning. Uh, I want to start by saying that, and integrating some of these observations uh, that were made today, that in my opinion, the human brain is the world's fastest, most portable supercomputer cluster. And every word has a meaning here. And I think this is quantum biology. I will not say too much about quantum. Um, being a quantum physicist and overstepping my competence already. Um, but on the issue of human brain and some of these ca capabilities that were mentioned, there's some numbers to, to quote. Uh, so we have 10 to the 10th neurons, plus minus some percentage, uh, roughly 10 to the 15th synapses. So there's 100,000 synapses per neuron. and Synapses operate at about 10 impulses per second, so that's uh, 10 to the uh, uh, 14 flops, uh, sorry, 10 to the 16 uh, synapse operations per second, uh, which compares to 10 to the 14 flops of the blue gene. So even at the most crude, the most classical level, the brain is better than the blue gene. But I, I'm going to try and convince you that actually the brain is orders of magnitude better than the blue gene, maybe all computers in the world put together a single brain, and of course, much more energy efficient as well, because it only consumes 25 watts as opposed to 1.5 megawatts for the blue gene. So I said it's a supercomputer cluster. And so what are the little computers inside the brain? Uh, so is there anything inside? So the, the I'm giving away. I'm, I'm also a little bit tired, so uh, give, cut me some slack, please. Each computer is a neuron, and each, each neuron has its own processing units. And you probably guess which ones are these. Um, but as a physicist, I also want to understand what sort of physics to apply to different uh, spatial ranges or, or dimensions. So typically, we would apply uh, thermodynamics to the level of an organism. And at the mesoscale, now we are grappling with nanotechnology. We don't really know what it is. Is it quantum? Is it classical? So this is where cells and, and subcellular structures operate at. And biomolecules with 10 to the third atoms, we are stretching into the range of quantum chemistry and eventually at a single level, a single atom or, or tens of atoms, quantum physics. 
It's important also to keep the, in mind the energy scale in biology. These are all the important biological distances and energy scales, and also affinity. So it's all biochemistry, reactions, and how fast they proceed. There are questions about time scales. I, I, I really want to draw your attention to the bottom of the scale, the GDP, ATP hydrolysis. And that's probably the only time I'll mention quantum today, the energy quantum, biological energy quantum. GTP is a bit smaller in energy than ATP. And I don't know what happened with the number there. It's, it's between 2 and 10 kT. I, I don't know. It got deleted. Maybe it's below the, the frame. Um, so um, this is above the threshold of noise, but not really inc incredibly much above the threshold of noise. All the, quantum pro all the biological processes use either GTP or ATP energy um, to, to continue. Therefore, it's important to keep this in mind. Uh, different computers, again, this is cutting things off. And, and again, for the third time today, I want to mention Günther Albrecht Bühler. Uh, and you can Google cell intelligence, and you'll find all about him and what he's been doing for the past 30 years. What, what actually is Albrecht Bühler demonstrated is, and, and this is the premise of my hierarchical uh, scale in the organization of this supercomputer cluster. He demonstrated actually that a single cell is uh, in intelligent. And when you go to his website, you will see this hundreds of, of pages of illustrations. And this is one of the video I tried to show you. And, and it's actually the cell is, is perceiving um, infrared signals. So it's electromagnetic signaling. Of course, it also perceives mechanical signals and, and chemical signals, which everybody knows about. Uh, but the fact that electromagnetic energy is uh, received and analyzed by the cell, by a single cell, is incredibly important in this context. Because the cell is already a, a computer in its own right, and a very powerful one at that. Um, OK, so we'll just go with the flow. <laughs> so some of it was covered, so I'll try to quickly go through it. Microtubules in mitosis and dividing cells and non-dividing cells, different roles, different architectures. Uh, they definitely play a central role in every cell. Every eukaryotic cell has microtubules. Uh, there is no time to discuss the var variety of the building blocks, which is incredibly interesting. The two billion years of evolution, this uh, experiment on, on our planet in terms of uh, T testing, it's, it's, a, it's a lab, F changing, mutating, and finding out what is the best for what different cells uh, use different building blocks. Tubulin is expressed by 20 genes in the human, and different variants are used for different cells. Cancer also makes choices, which is incidental to this talk. Um, in nerve cells, you have uh, microtubules packing dan densely the axon, and also um, present dendrite. So I don't know if anything will work today. No. <laughs> OK. So <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to show this dynamic instability. There's a video that doesn't show. But microtubules are very dynamically in, uh, unstable. They, they grow and shrink. It's a very typical, different polymer from anything else in, in the body. Uh, DNA, actin filaments, intermediate filaments, they don't behave like microtubules. So there's something special about it biologically. And we'd like to know what is special about microtubules um, physically or biochemically. And that's another cartoon which I uh, stole from Stuart Hameroff in this particular case. Um, so they, they self-assemble and disassemble. I, so I want to add another, another buzzword to it, uh, evolvable computer, uh, recyclable computer. If we can capture this power, that will be incredible. Um, and uh, talking microtubules, interacting with actin filaments, with ion channels, this is documented in, uh, in the literature. Um, now, the challenge is the integration of these various levels in a hierarchy. And bottom up or, or top down, I don't care. Um, we'll try to, uh, to look at it from the bottom and create um, um, models that stretch different orders of magnitude. So that's uh, shown here in a schematic with, uh, with, with um, a tubulin dimer and microtubule. And microtubule it maps in a, in a bundle of 
uh, microtubules inside the dendrite. And probably none of this will work either. <laughs> and this will not work. Uh, and this will not work. So, um, sorry about this, but. Uh, maybe. Yeah, everything is uh, skipping it. So, so Anya Brown talked about the, the geometry, the, the topology, and, and beautiful uh, crystal structures. I, I have some, you, what I'll show you is some computer reconstructors in silico understanding of these uh, structures uh, built together atom by atom. Uh, and this is the incredibly powerful today. You can use computational resources to, um, to um, reconstruct biological structures that otherwise you can't see. Crystallography gives you uh, fixed images at some level of resolution. Um, so this is a, a video from actual Berkeley from Eva Nogales uh, and her group um, showing the formation of microtubules from tubulin dimers and the structure of dimers in great detail, the ribbons, the, the helices and, and the uh, sheets, and how they fit into this cylindrical structure, how uh, depolarization is asymmetric, it's different from polymerization, the, the rings, and actually gamma tubulin is used to uh, nucleate microtubules, so it's a different uh, building block uh, forming rings from which uh, alpha and beta tubulin dimers grow into um, cylinders. Um, I will stop this movie in a second because we don't want to fall asleep. But uh, um, Stuart mentioned GTP and GTP hydrolysis. So beta tubulin has ex exchangeable binding si site for GTP. And that is one of the possible modes of um, behavior Conformational change uh, is caused by hydrolysis of GTPs. That's, again, the quantum of energy, just about 2.5 kT, just above noise level, enough to cause these instabilities to take place. So, so it's a very powerful uh, nanomachinery, if you want to look at it this way. All right, I'll stop it now. And uh, go back to the slideshow. Um, one of the structures that was not mentioned today and, and plays an in incredibly important role in microtubule biology that we know of, and uh, in my opinion also in, in all the processes that were mentioned today, is the C termini. The C termini of, of tubulin are not crystallographically re uh, resolved. These are little tails, whiskers, that uh, decorate the surface of a microtubule, and they are very dynamic. Um, they, they contain 40% of the electrostatic charge of the protein, uh, being only a very small fraction of the mass. And they have um, involved in conformational dance uh, that is highly dependent on the sequences. So, so these C termini have um, sequence variability, which is completely unique to each species and each uh, form of tubulin in the human body. And I think that's. That's where a lot of research will go into. And a, a word of caution, if you use laboratory techniques, uh, uh, Anirban and, and, uh, and colleagues, they have to be very careful what sort of tubulin they are using, because each tubulin has different uh, C termini uh, that are absolutely crucial to their functioning. Here's a reconstruction of the microtubule in silico. That's the entire. Um, it's millions of atoms here, actually, it's, it's, uh, that went into the computer program that created th this image. And, um, and you have C termini that I mentioned uh, decorating the surface. They have dynamical structures, and I have some videos to show you how they, um, they have different modes of, uh, of oscillation. So we've talked today about 8 megahertz, 12, 11 megahertz. Some of it may have to do, actually, with the dynamics of, of C termini. Um, and, and they are shown here prominently in a, in a rec reconstruction of the tubulin dimer. So these are the protruding, in this particular case, straight up. But that's not the, uh, necessarily the, the confirmation that they always adopt. It was just for the purpose of simulation. Um, OK, so 
Uh, again, more uh, for, for the physicists, actually, electrostatics plays a cru crucial role here because uh, the way the structure is put together in this beautiful lattice, including the ring, um, reflects the uh, attraction between the negative and positive charges as they are uh, expressed on the surface of tubulin. That shows you how the ring is made, for example. And, and this is the formation of the uh, microtubule from dimers, also following the principles of electrostatics. This has not been completely understood to the greatest detail and the energy in, involved in the formation, but uh, definitely the principle is there. And that's uh, a reconstruction with an electrostatic uh, surface um, rendition. So the red is negative charge, blue is positive. It has a, actually in, a very important meaning because um, microtubules have a net uh, polarity. They are not, it's not arbitrary uh, which is the plus end and the minus end, both from the biological point of view. One is um, more actively growing than plus than the other minus, but also they have uh, electrostatic polarity. So there is an electric field along the microtubule which would explain some of the effects that we're talking about today and also some of the experiments that, that I participated in with Dr. Cantiello from Harvard. This uh, slide also shows you the, the values of these charges, which maybe in view of these technical difficulties, I will just skip. What I want to spend a few minutes on is C termini and their dynamical um, states. Uh, th those of you who are physicists in the audience will uh, right away hopefully think about spin, spin up, spin down. Actually, the C termini have two stable states that we demonstrated by molecular dynamic simulations. One is up and one is down. In fact, uh, it uh, makes contact with a positively charged patch on the opposite dimer. So a beta tubulin C terminus touches the alpha tubulin positive di dimer and, and vice versa. This actually also causes conformational changes, work that is uh, currently submitted for publication. So uh, at least four states, at least four, because for the dimer. Uh, up and down for beta, up and down for alpha, so two, two times two is four. Um, and this is another simulation that I dare not touch uh, that shows you how actually dynamically these states uh, um, evolve. You can start with the down state or bent C terminus and run the simulation for a few nanoseconds and then there will be, you'll see it un unbind and vice versa. So, so these things oscillate. There are natural oscillations between these two states. Um, I'll, I'll give up on all the videos, by the way. So, uh, And these are the ones that I maybe I would like to show. <laughs> but maybe at the end. We'll come back to it, time permitting. Uh, what I'm showing you here, and we've classified them completely, it's, it's, it's almost like a library of dynamical states. So. I'll step away from the microphone and, and talk like this for, for a second so everybody understands the, the, the message. We have these C terminal states that may go down or up, but they also depend very strongly on where they come, what kind of tubulin they come from. So it's bovine tubulin or you don't like it. Or human tubulin. Um. In the, in the lingo of, of tubulin microtubules, it's alpha 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they're isoforms, isotypes of tubulin, and beta 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8. Um, each one has a different mode, has a characteristic dynamical mode. It's like a dancer. Somebody's dancing the, the waltz, the other is dancing the tango. Somebody's cha-cha, they have their own little dances. And I think this is very much in terms of resonance. They, so if you can now imagine the microtubule decorated with these dancers, and it's made, one cell is making dancers from alpha 6 and the other from beta 4, they will be engaged in different dances and therefore different resonant frequencies. I, I hope this message is getting through, and I'll show you these dances. I have all of them, but assembled. Oh. Okay. Um, so th that's under the, the uh, topic of C-thermal tail dynamics. And they, they also, we have estimated that they oscillate on the frequency of gigahertz. So maybe not 8 megahertz, uh, but much faster than that. 
And this is now the experiment that was performed at Harvard with Horatio Cantillo. Um, Horatio is a very skilled biochemist, uh, biophysicist, who is, to my knowledge, the only person in the world, maybe outside of Tsukuba, who can actually grab microtubules with micropipettes and manipulate them. He used uh, micropipettes, which were electrodes also. So he sent uh, electric pulses from one pipette, micropipette, to the other, measured the signal. And to his astonishment, and, and mine also, um, this is what, what they found. Actually, these electrical pulses were amplified. So, if, so the, the blue one is the in, in, in initial pulse at, at, the, in, at the first end, and the red is at the receptor end, of the sorry, emitter and uh, receptor. Uh, and the amplitude is increased between, depending on the simulation, between two and, and five times. So this is a big puzzle, uh, not in addition to all these crazy things that, uh, that Stuart talked about and Ironbound mentioned. This is a published experiment in the respectable journals, biophysical journal, uh, reporting an amplification of elect electric pulses along the uh, microtubule surface. We have uh, published papers also theoretically explaining what's happening here. And they involve actual ionic, so now to, to some physical concepts and explanations. Ionic waves which were sent by the one, elect, one of the electrodes sends an uh, ionic cloud, which senses the surface of, it, of the microtubule. The microtubule is actually acting to attract ions because it's negatively charged. We have positive ions, sodium, potassium, and they congregate around it, and they, they feel it. Uh, so on, on one level, a microtubule surface is a capacitor. On another, water is a resistor. Ions and, and water resist the flow because of the viscosity. So we have two of these. And there is also helicity that uh, Anir Brown mentioned. So it, it, it also can involve uh, inductance. And we created the RLC model that, um, uh, sorry, um, that is sketched here. It's an electrical circuit model which, uh, with uh, parameter values that were estimated from uh, from molecular biophysics. Um, one complication that, that uh, is interesting and important to observe, especially in the context of, of the work from Tsukuba, is that a microtubule is not a, um, a solid surface. It has pores, nanopores, periodically uh, located between alpha and beta dimers. Um, so uh, ions actually are drawn inside the lumen because of the potential difference between the outside surface, which is more negative, than the, the inside surface, which is more positive. So we've created a three-dimensional model that includes flow along, inside, and through the lumen. And uh, this is published in this year's physical review. Again, Google it. Um, and we found, actually, that it explains asymmetry. This is an IV uh, characteristic, asymmetry of the um, of the microtubules' uh, conductive property. Um, so Stuart mentioned this. Uh, and now let me try and summarize some numbers. I started out by saying that the, the, that the brain is probably more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer. I think um, we are s uh, scratching the surface. And here's a conservative estimate in terms of if you take into account the number of microtubules, the number of neurons, in the brain and the number of states that each dimer can, uh, can encode. This is actually before we do the phosphorylation calculation. Uh, c terminized states at least four per dimer. Electron hopping, there are, uh, I didn't have the, uh, the time here to, to, to show you that electrons also have uh, double well states in which they can hop. So let's say four. And conformational changes, this is documented uh, experimentally, two per dimer. So, Conservatively speaking, you're going to have 32 states per dimer for one gigabyte of, um, of um, processing power per neuron with 100 billion neurons in the brain. If you use your brain to full capacity, Einstein said that only 10%, and even I think he would be in this category. So um, let's say um, put these numbers together. That's 10 to the 20th bits per brain. Uh, is my estimate of the computational capability of the average human brain. Um, and if these transitions can occur at nanosecond uh, scale, then you have 10 to the 28 flops. 
Actually, some of you may be very skeptical of this estimate and will laugh at me. Um, uh, let me just, actually, don't laugh, because von Neumann in 1950 came up with the same number, um, 10 to the 20th. Subsequently, we became more and more cynical about our ability to think. And, <laughs> and you have the, you know, the, the guru, some of the gurus of, of modern computational science estimating only ten, one gigabyte, one gigabit um, per brain with two bits per second of visual, verbal, tactile, musical memory <laughs> and a human lifetime of um, ten, two and a half billion seconds. Uh, this is incredibly depressing. How does it compare? My estimate is in red, and you can challenge me on this. Um, 10 to the 19th, if we use bytes, okay, so that's, that's still 100% capacity. Uh, the total number of the data on the web is 10 to the 15th, probably growing by 1% every minute. Uh, the Library of Congress, 10 to, three times 10 to the 15th. So um, I think we, we are definitely capable of incredible amounts of information storage. Uh, the question of how do you read and uh, write and read uh, is, of course, of absolute importance. And we, we, uh, with Stewart's um, um, explanation of how we see phosphorylation sites on, on tubulin as potential uh, memory storage, um, we are getting closer and closer. Um, I, I want to say. This is not tubulin and, and using proteins as uh, memory chips is, is not our original idea. This has been around, and I want to give credit to David Wishart from the University of Alberta, who has been thinking about this for a long time, and perhaps there can be even a greater capacity than, than what I mentioned here. Um, um, but what, what, what I want to, um, before I forget and before it's, the time is over, I, I want to say something that, that may be a little bit on the... Um, speculative side. You, you must have heard about um, near-death experiences and people going through this life uh, history in, in their mind, and everything is encoded, apparently. If, if we believe these stories, then if you, if you want to store all this information that you ever received through sensory perception, this will be an incredible amount of information. And, and these numbers that Landauer and others are talking about are insufficient for that. So you really have to look deeper. And the second possibility is hypnosis. Also, under hypnosis, people recall a lot of events that normally you don't have access to. So they may be stored quite, quite deeply in the brain. Um, and this, just one, one, um, one more um, um, addition to Stuart's d d description of our uh, calmodulin kinase. The, the, the original I uh, idea for this actually came recently, two years ago, through the experiment report in Science Daily, and I, th I think subsequently in Science, or PNAs, I remember the, the, the journal, where actually calmodulin kinase was inhibited in mice, and, and, and the mice lost the memory of training in the previous half an hour. So that's how it kind of started the, the search for how calmodulin kinase is involved in memory. And, um, and we linked it to phosphorylation sites of tubulin. Um, remember these pictures. So my estimate in, regarding the, the capacity of the, the human brain through microtubules did not involve this aspect at all. That's another uh, um, means of storing information. Now, we did something more that Stuart didn't mention. We, Travis Craddock, my student, um, asked the, the following question following uh, after actually the advice from Stuart. Where do anesthetics really bind? Only, only to, um, to receptors in synapses, or is the possibility that any possibility of re anesthetics binding to tubulin? And if so, where? So this is unpublished work, but finished calculations. And I'm going to give you the sites of anesthetic binding on tubulin that we discovered through computational modeling. And it's very telling. Uh, so I highlighted in red some 
some uh, sites for anesthetic bindings, halothane was one of these, the volatile anesthetics that we tested. Um, they bind in places where oncologic uh, agents, uh, chemotherapy agents bind, Taxol, Vinblastin, Colchicine, and also where GDP binds. So uh, this is a testable prediction that we will be uh, confirming in the lab. Uh, in other words, if, if this is so, anesthetics could be inhibitors of uh, things like Taxol. Uh, another is they bind uh, to a lot of tryptophans, and interestingly, serines and threonines in C-terminal regions. This is exactly where calmodulin kinase binds. These pictures that, that uh, Stuart and I just a second ago showed, the, um, what do you call it, the poodle? No, right, the nanopoodle. The nanopoodle binds exactly where anesthetics bind, in one of the sites. So it makes sense that you lose memory because you, the nanopoodle doesn't work. And finally, also bind in the positive patches where C termini bind. I told you that C termini uh, bend over and bind to the respective uh, part, uh, patch, positive patches on the beta or alpha <coughs> tubulin. Um, they also bind there. So there is a lot of interesting um, um, information, I guess, to process. We have the skeleton of a model. Um, and just to, to add to the complexity, um, you can have, um, in addition to these rather fast changes in information storage capabilities, you may also have in the brain long-term effects of learning and sometimes pathological developments. Stuart mentioned Alzheimer's disease and, and decoupling of uh, tau maps, for, map taus from microtubules. You can also have um, strengthening of these connections through, th through enforcement, uh, through reinforcement, through learning and repetition. So this, again, a video clip that uh, I dare not touch, uh, shows you how these uh, map interconnections dynamically uh, change architecture. So that's another level of, um, and I, I guess I'm done. Allow me just to show one of these dancing, uh, dances, maybe with, after the, I s go through the conclusions. The human brain, in my opinion, has an amazing computational potential. I call it a supercomputer cluster. The neuron is a, a, a single computational unit, a cell, like any other cell, can exist on, on their own, um, and performs complex computational um, processes at the level of quantum of biological energy. I dare not say quantum of physics, but quantum of biological energy. If it's an evolvable, it's itself, the neuron is an evolvable computer which communicates with up to 100,000 nearby computers. So think about these communicating networks inside the brain. And within each computer, you have microchips, which we call microtubules. Uh, as elementary computational elements with approximately one gigabyte of memory or random access memory or whatever else there may be there. And this is all I prepared for today, and I apologize for all these uh, technical difficulties. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have some time for questions for Jack. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. There's yeah, great, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to thank you especially for uh, bringing up Albrecht Bueller's work, and I wanted to highlight one other thing that, that you didn't bring out, and Albrecht Bueller has an area he refers to as functional anarchy of the genome. I want to comment and tie this a little bit back into what Elizabeth talked about earlier. Um, the first stake through the heart of the central dogma of biology was really uh, when Mar Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize for the notion of jumping genes. And in her acceptance speech, she said, we will be surprised to find out the degree to which the genome senses its environment and shapes itself in response to that. Now, if that doesn't make Schrodinger's cat start to howl, the idea of a sensor and a shaper, it did to me when I was first looking at some random mutations. So I would be happy to direct anybody into the uh, genomic literature um, the second stake through the heart of the uh, central dogma of biology now is with the sequencing of the genome. Less than 2% of the human genome codes for any protein. And people who look at that say, how can you generate something as complex as a human being 
from such a small number of genes, they, uh, what I think they haven't come to terms with yet are the uh, non-coding portion of the genome. Forty percent of the human genome is mobile. It gets up and it moves around and it rearranges itself. And Albrecht Bueller talks about this in the functional anarchy of the genome. So thank you very, we can talk some more offline. Very good comment, actually. And I think there is also a, 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 a talk back to the, to the gene. So there's two-way communication. It's not just instruction. It's actual information flowing back in. And I, I wouldn't blame Mike Rivers for everything, but <laughs> They may also play a role in this. Okay. Um, Jack, you want to describe your video? So, so this is one of the CTRM. I, I, it's, it's from Beta Tubulin 2. I'll show you. So that's basically, remember these whiskers? They're not just randomly uh, uh, flailing around uh, subject to thermal wind. Uh, when you simulate this in the, in the computer, you'll see that each one of them has a slightly different mode of vibration or oscillation. Of, um, I'm going to show, I have all, all of them classified. We've done extensive simulations with my former student, Tyler Luchko, who's now at Rutgers. Uh, this is, you see, quite different. And each of these modes has a different frequency. So you can communicate with them. That could be another dynamical way of encoding. Uh, that's, uh, this address, you know, this, the shape that I'm showing you is encoded by the gene. So, so it's in, in the genome, by the way. So, it's beta 3 tubulin, beta 2 tubulin, it's a different gene, and every organism will have a different one. So if you want to cure cancer in mice, maybe you'll need a different frequency. Um, and that's another one. So I have uh, many of these. But just to illustrate the point that they complete the diff uh, they execute completely different motions. Um, so okay. that's the explanation. Thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker last time.